Maçon Baro on zetrici. All right, hang on. Bear with me. I want to see something here. Hold on, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. All right, this is what I want you to do. On three, how do you say hello in Dothraki? Macho Maro One. Here, try it. Once, try it once with me. Try it once with me. Macho Maro One. Okay, I'm gonna give you the count of three, and I want you to say Macho Maro One on three. Okay, ready? One, two, three. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Put that video up there. Okay, so thank you guys for having me here. And I'm ready to talk to you about something that I know you desperately want to know about. <laughs> That's my kitty, Kelly. But no, no, probably we're going to talk about something about languages in Hollywood. No cats. Probably. Maybe just one cat. That's my little boy, Roman. We'll see him again. Anyway, so this is a picture of me um, 18 years ago. Wow. No, no, no. No, no, no. Was it? Yeah, no, no. It is 18 years ago at this point. My goodness. Anyway, that was me as a freshman at UC Berkeley where I, uh, I enrolled with the intention of uh, basically uh, being a literature major so that I could teach high school English. And that was really my ultimate goal. Um, but I was also desperately interested in learning language. I don't know where it came from. I just kind of started learning languages when I was uh, 17 years old. I became very interested in learning as many as I possibly could. So I studied them on my own. And then when I got to college, I discovered they taught a lot of languages there, and so I decided to take some. For example, I took uh, Arabic because one of the things, I just loved the script. I thought it was so beautiful, I loved the way it looked, so I decided to take Arabic. And I always thought this word was one of my most favorite because it's just a beautiful word, Dijaj, if you pronounce it in the Levantine, Levantine style, not Egyptian. And of course, it means chicken. <laughs> that's, what, that's what that word means, Dijaj, chicken. In Egypt, they would say Degag, not as pretty. Um, and then I studied Russian, because again, it kind of had a fancy script and I really liked it. That just says James, the name. But I thought it was really nice. Um, and then after that, I studied Middle Egyptian. Can you guess what this word is? Huh? <laughs> That's the word for cat. And you pronounce it meow. That's the middle Egyptian word for cat, and it's real. Um, it's funny, the, the, the little sign on the end there, the, the part at the beginning is how you pronounce it. The sign at the end is just to remind you that it's a cat, kind of cute. Um, there it is, another cat picture. Um, and then I also studied this language called Esperanto. I don't know if you've heard of this. Uh, Esperanto was the first created language that I ever heard of in my entire life. It was a language that was created in 1887, by a Polish gentleman named Zamenhof, who he created this language for the entire world to speak because he thought if the whole world spoke it, then there would be no more war. Um, didn't work out so well, but nevertheless, the language was there. So I studied it because it was taught at Berkeley, and I thought, oh, this is really interesting. Somebody created a language like this. Um, but then the next step for me because I didn't really think anything other, uh, about it other than it was creating language. The next step was studying linguistics at UC Berkeley. Linguistics is a scientific study of language. So rather than uh, studying languages to learn them, you study languages to figure out their structure, how languages differ, how they're the same, um, and kind of what makes them tick. Uh, what is it about human languages that's human? And this is what unlocked uh, the key for me. Basically, I had this idea that we have Esperanto, a creative language for international communication. And what I was learning in linguistics, and this led me to what we call conlanging, language creation. And uh, that was when I started doing it. I started creating my very first language just in my notebook when I was supposed to be studying linguistics in class. 
And, uh, and I kind of produced my first language, which <laughs> it's, it's embarrassing at this point. Remember, this was 2001, so this was uh, 17 years ago that I created this language uh, called Meg Davy, which kind of, <laughs> this is my, this is my uh, explanation for what that language was like. I was really interested in Arabic, and I knew about Esperanto, and I kind of combined the two to create a language. So uh, for those that don't know Arabic, Arabic works in a very, very interesting way. It has what's called the tricontinental root system. So these are them. You have these three letters, uh, K, T, and B, these three sounds that, of course, go the opposite way in Arabic. And you can produce a whole bunch of different words with different meanings by just arranging vowels and prefixes and suffixes around these three consonants so long as they appear in the same order. So like here's an example. Up at the top you have katib, which means writer. And then you have kitab, which means book. And you have maktab, which means uh, office, right? Maktaba is library. Um, kutub is book. You know, uh, books, plural. So you kind of see how it works. And you also have a verb here. So maktub is we write, aktub is I write, and then uh, katabat is she wrote. So you kind of see how this works. You just have K, T, and B, they're always in the same order, and everything around them kind of shifts. And then you get different words like that. Um, so I thought, that's a really cool system. Why don't I try something like that? So I did something like that. Here's a cool word in my first language, Nick Davy. I don't know if you can see this in the back. That top word is jasa, that means flamethrower, because I thought that was a word I would need. Um, and then you have a word flame, and then the southern word jisfa, which means flame colored. I have no idea why anybody would need that word. But it didn't stop there. So we have jessafi, flames, jessafu, flame, jessafa, little flame, there's some verbs. And then you can do stuff like this jisef, place of things, jasef, like a place of flames. This is my favorite. Jisfi, flame jis, no idea what that means. And then it gets even better. So you know, like, uh, a second as far as time goes, you can have a flame second, but you can also have a flame minute, and a flame hour, and a flame day, and a flame month, and a flame season, and a flame year, and a flame decade, and a flame century gets better, flame millennium. So <laughs> this is the very first language I created. And I should have, this should have given me pause, because it's like, words like this never exist in natural languages. And I never really paused to think about why until I met many other language creators. This is the first language creation conference at UC Berkeley in 2006. Yeah. And um, this is just a small sampling of the thousands of language creators that there are in the world. But I met them and I saw what they were doing and I was like, what I'm doing is not good. I need to get better. And so I started to learn from these other language creators, and that was when I found what we call uh, naturalism. Um, naturalism is where we try to create languages that mirror as closely as possible the quirks and idiosyncrasies of natural languages, um, whether they're regular or irregular. And I'll show you some examples of what I mean. So, um, this is, oh yeah. Sorry, I forgot what I was doing. All right, so the, the process, the, the thing that makes natural languages natural is that they undergo linguistic evolution in these three areas. That is, the sounds of a language will change over time, um, the meanings of words will change over time, and then the grammar itself will change over time. So I'll give you an example of each. First, phonology. So we have something like this. There's going to be lots of cats in this one. But this is very simple, right? You have cat on the left and cats on the right. The one on the left is singular, the one on the right is plural. All you do is add S. Very, very, very simple. But this is not as simple. So that's my daughter, by the way. <laughs> so you have mouse on the right and mice. I'm sorry, mouse on the left and mice on the right. Have you ever wondered why you don't just add an S and get mouses for the plural? Instead, you have mice. Well, it turns out that there's a story behind it. Um, in the olden days, the very olden days when people spoke English, this is actually what it looked like. The word for one mouse was moose. And the word for more than one mouse was moosey. Very regular. Very regular, so you just add that I on the end there. Very simple, very simple. 
Then what happened is people started to pronounce things a little differently. The first thing that happened is that I colored the vowel oo. So you no longer said oo, you said oo. For those who've studied German, this is like the U with two dots over it. You can do it very simply by saying E like that, but rounding your lips. So not E, but E. Yeah. Sometimes you do it when chanting somebody's name that has an E in it because it makes it sound louder. Like, I don't know, if there was a guy named Steve, and you wanted to chant his name, and you go, Steve, 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 it kind of makes it sound deeper like that. So this is what happened at some stage in the English language. Then the vowel on the end changed, so it became not musi, but musa, because we kind of started to lose vowels at the end. Then we just lost it completely. And this is now the only indication of plural is this vowel. So there's moose and muse. Then we lost that vowel, so it was moose and mees. And then we lost those vowels in what was called the great vowel ship. So the long e became an i, and the long u became an l, and that's how we get mouse and mice. So that's how that happened. It was nothing nefarious, it wasn't crazy, it was just the sounds changed over time. And that's how we got this bizarre uh, irregularity in English. Same thing happens with the lexicon. Have you ever wondered about uh, this word? Not cat, not kitten, but uh, pants. <laughs> Have you ever wondered about this word? It's so weird that it has an S on the end, um, and that it seems to be plural, even though we only wear one of them. I mean, arguably there's two, but they're sewn together in the middle. But anyway, um, so this is where this word actually came from. Um, this guy. You probably wouldn't guess this, but this is actually where the word comes from. This is a character from an Italian uh, stage comedy, or rather, actually, it was a French comedy that, that parodied the Italian comedy. The character's name was Pantalon, and he was supposed to be emulating, I guess, somebody from Venice. So it's supposed to be like, you look at him and say, oh yeah, he's Venetian, I don't know, I don't know how. But um, he became very, he was a very comical character, and one of the things that was very uh, stereotypical of him was these tight-fitting pants that he would wear, or as they would call them, trousers. And so these pants came to be known as pantalones, things that pantalone would wear. And then we kind of dropped the S, and then we've shortened it to pantaloons, a word that still exists, and then we shortened it to pants. And that's how we got the meaning of the word. It was all tied to this bizarre, popular character in a stage play. Stories like this happen all over the place in languages all over the world. Um, and then for grammar, this is my favorite bit. Um, so, oh, skipped ahead here. So when I came to Trichy, you might say something like this, right? So, nan Trichy pi Try my best word. So, um, so look at look at this word here. Um, By the way, a bit of sound change. You ever notice that there's a letter you don't even pronounce there? You know, it looks like it should be boring, but you don't even really say that here, do you? You just say boring. Yeah. So yeah, you can see this kind of stuff thing happening in the language all the time. Okay, so this is literal, right? I'm going to Trichy, very, very literal. But then what if you wanted to say something like this here? And there's my kitty. So you might say, let me see if I can get this right. So, uh, I'm sorry, mutam. Yeah, I see the U there, I see it. Mutam, and then this word is go. Oh shoot, I think I forgot this one. Go. oh, what's that one? Go. Oh, koruka, koruka, koren, yeah? Okay. That one is so sorry. Uh, but notice that's the same word there, right? It's the exact same word. And in one case, it means motion, like literally going to. And in the other word, it's a kind of future tense. Um, same word, just different situations, right? 
Um, and that's because this is actually what happened. There is an idea that motion gets turned into something that indicates the future. And it's actually quite common in the world's languages. So like, uh, here's just three languages, English, French, and Spanish. I'm going to eat, means I'm going to eat in the future. Je vais en manger, uh, I'm going to eat. And then, voir um, mer, means I'm going to eat in Spanish. Um, and you, the same, it means the same thing in all of those languages. So visa means go to, and voya means go to in all those languages. So this is a very common process, but it's where you have one word that means one thing, and then it comes to have a special grammatical meaning, and pretty soon you forget why it's there. You just, that's just how you say it. So, those are kind of the things I do. Um, when it comes to evolving a language, but I did want to mention one thing. It's kind of separate from language, um, but it's uh, writing. See, you have the little pen there. <laughs> but um, writing is, of course, it's, uh, it's, I mean, language is a human invention, but writing is very much kind of a, a conscious human in invention. But nevertheless, writing does change over time. And this is something that we also do. Um, uh, evolve writing systems. Well, so, we have this, this is English, right? We know how uh, that writing system evolved. And, but a real tree, something that language creators really value is, uh, is this right here. The fact that you have recorded history of how the Tamil script evolved over the centuries. It's amazing. I absolutely, this is like one of my favorite pictures of all time. Because you can just look at it and see what happened. It's, it's amazing, too, to yeah. I love it, I love this language. It's amazing to compare them at very distant points. Like, take the second century AD, for example. All right. Oh, of course, we know why, uh, I'm sorry, we know why it evolved the way it did, and it's because people started to write on palm leaves. And palm leaves really punctured really easily. They were really easy to tear, so rather than having a bunch of hard lines like that, the lines kind of got curvy so that you didn't tear the palm leaf. But yeah, comparing the second century to modern times, so you have a glyph that looks like this, and it now looks like that. Where did the second line come from? You can actually track it over the stages. Now, separate one looks like this, and became that. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. And here's a C, a very rounded C. This is a, this is a glyph. Um, in the second century, that now looks like this. Uh, I mean, you can see how that happened, very, very simple. Now, a very similar looking glyph that nevertheless was different became this. It's just amazing, isn't it? It's just looking at these evolutions, they're so inspirational uh, when it comes to creating your own writing system because you can see how incremental change can change things over time. It's just awesome. So. This is something that I have done as well. So like when I was starting to create a writing system for one of the shows I worked on, I started like at this stage with pen and paper, but then I also evolved it over time so that this was stage one, and then this was stage two, and then this is the final stage right there. And then, the, the, by the way, I also do abogitas because I love abogitas. I think they're the best. So here's, uh, this is just a regular K and then a long A, then an E, and a long E, for, all for K. That then turned into single characters, and then became this in the final stage. And then also when characters look too similar to one another, I use this strategy, so now it's just a dot there. <laughs> I love that, it's fun. Anyway, so, um, and then of course, uh, so this is the end result, this is like what a sentence written on, uh, in this language looks like. And then they would use it in the television show to make uh, posters like this. This just happened to be a campaign poster that was used in one episode of Love Fun. So, anyway, what I'm just showing you is linguistic evolution. And these are basically the tools that language creators use to produce languages that are very natural, like the ones that we speak. And so I use these tools to create a bunch of different languages. So, there's linguistic evolution. <laughs> I still haven't gotten a squirrel in Pokemon Go. They just don't come up. I'm looking for them. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, I thought you were cheering for my cats and my daughter. No, no, I'm cheering for this. <laughs> so, 
so these are the these are the shows that I've worked on. So I started working on Game of Thrones in my first show in 2009. I created these three languages for them. I also created a fourth language. I created a language for the children of the forest, a whole language for them, for season six. And then they decided, eh, we're not gonna use it. <laughs> oh well. I still got I still got paid for it though. So. Uh, the next show, this is the one I was showing you a little bit from, it's called Defiance, it was on sci-fi. I created four languages for that show, and four different writing systems for it as well. Uh, <laughs> um, I also worked on a very small show, ran for one season on the CW, and I created a, a language and writing system for that. Um, I worked on the second, the second <laughs> That was a fun one. That was a fun one. Um, also, just a little show that was on sci-fi. It ran for a couple seasons. I created a language for that. And I created a language for The Hundred. It runs on the CW. Some, some people know that. That's a fun one. Created a language to get a sign. Um, show Penny Dreadful, which is really good. Yeah! All right. I love this show. That one was good. Um, now let's see, what else? The Shinar Chronicles. I'm currently working on it right now. Oh, somebody knows it. Um, the Warcraft era. That was fun since I played World of Warcraft for 10 years. That was fun. Um, Dr. Strange. Uh, created a little bit for that. Uh, a show currently airing called Emerald City. Um, and I created two languages for that. Uh, and I figured, why not, to now, or, or today would be a good time to announce it. I created two new languages for a brand new movie that's going to air on Netflix, starring Will Smith and Joel Edgerton. Um, I have no idea when it's debuting, probably uh, end of this year, beginning of next year, but I created two languages for that and two writing systems. I had a lot of fun working on that. And also, um, Will Smith is always laughing. He's such a good guy. I like him. Anyway, so, I wanted to give you kind of a detailed example of what I go through uh, when I get a script and how I translate a line. So we're going to look at um, an episode of Game of Thrones from Season 3, uh, Episode 4. So this is what I get. I know this is going to be a little small for you to see, but this is a script page. And in this script, there's a whole bunch of lines here. And at the top, it says, there's a line by a character named Stasmus, um, and, it's, uh, and it says above the line, let's see you <laughs> um, it says above the line in parentheses, Valeria, and then it's in italics. Everything else that's in italics on the rest of the page, then, is something that I would need to translate into Valeria. And so we're going to look at one line, which is uh, a line from Daenerys, which is, a dragon is not a slave. So, this line, when you get a line like this, that's written in English, um, you have to kind of break it down. So the first thing I do is you look at all of these words, and they come with some, uh, I guess, grammatical information with them. So you look at a dragon, we know that it's uh, singular, it's a topic of a sentence, it's indefinite, and it has some sort of meaning associated with dragon, and then same similar thing with uh, slave, and then for is not, uh, we know that's a present tense, third person singular, negative. So this is the information that comes to it from English. So then what I have to do is figure out how this translates into High Valeria and Daenerys' languages. So the first thing I do is I find the words I need, and these are just their citation forms. I pull them from the dictionary, and then they come with grammatical information that's unique to Valerian. So for example, Valerian has a bunch of genders, so the gender information comes with it. Comes with it. Valerian is a case language, just like Dummel. It's got eight cases, and so um, I need to know what declension class each word belongs to. And then for is not, um, there's a, some special grammar that's associated with it. So then the next step is putting it in the right order. High Valerian orders stuff like this. Actually, just like Dummel, the verb comes at the end, the subject comes first, everything else comes in the middle. Um, so we flip the word order like that. Then we have to add the grammatical information in to make sure that it works grammatically. So that's uh, something like Sagan changes to Ixos 
and then we um, and then we have our sentence right there. So the parts in between when it actually comes to creating the language is you have to, of course, create all of the verbal paradigms. So this one's a regular one. You might recognize this word from Valar uh, uh, This is just the present tense. And that's a regular one. And then, of course, you have to create the irregular ones, too. This is the verb that we need to write for. Um, and then you have to create all of the tenses. So these are sort of some of the tenses of Pythagorean. And then there are active and passive forms of the verb. Then there's indicative and subjunctive. Uh, oops. These are, so this is all the verb forms of one verb of high valerian. That's how, uh, that's how much you need to know. <laughs> so, slightly, slightly less complex than Latin, slightly more complex than Spanish. I think. So, uh, next I wanted to, to mention just a little grammatical bit about this sentence. So, in English we do have a subjunctive, it just rarely comes up. So this is when you say, like, if he were assertive, he'd be eating ice cream right now, because I would be. Um, and so the reason why you say were there is because it's a vestige of the subjunctive form that used to exist in English. It used to exist for all the verbs, now it just exists for that one, really. Um, so uh, Spanish is very similar. So in Spanish you would say, oh, que venga, uh, which is, I hope he comes. And venga is in the subjunctive, you wouldn't say, oh, that que viene. That means kind of like, I hope he's coming right now. It means something different, a little strange, you wouldn't say that. Same thing happens in Hibernarian. So we have Mazios Jairan, that's how you say, I hope he comes. You wouldn't say Mazios Jairan. All right, so that's how the subjunctive works. There was a verb in Hibernarian in the olden days, Davur, which meant to refuse, to prohibit. And you would say something like Mazios Davorra. I don't allow him to come, or I prevent him from coming, and you would use the subjunctive, not the present. So you wouldn't say mas is that will come. Then what happened is that this word actually changed. It, it shortened up as it grammaticalized. So davor became davor, like that, and then it didn't conjugate the same way you say he will come, not he wills come. Uh, you don't put the s on there. So it just stays by itself. And that's how you get ixos daor, where ixos is in the subjunctive, it's not in the present. Isa daor will be the present. So that's how you get the grammatical bit of that little part of the translation. And next, of course, there are etymologies here. So zadabitzes is the word for dragon, and maybe you can guess what the etymology is there. Birds. <laughs> um, and then luhairagon means to serve. And this is where I want to talk about something that I got to add to the episode that wasn't necessarily in the script. So, dohairagon means to serve. Dohairagon means to serve habitually. Dohairagon means serving habitually. It's an adjective or a participle. And then dohairagos is one who serves habitually, and that's the high valerian word for slave. But this is where you take the details of the scene and have them inform your translation. Oops, sorry. So, is this, uh, let's see in a second. So, zandriz es dohairagos y sosao is what the sentence would translate as. But, to give you some background on the scene, all right, for those who don't know Game of Thrones, this is, this is Daenerys, and Daenerys is an exiled queen. And Daenerys wants to get an army. These are the Unsullied, and she's hoping to purchase this army. These are, this is an army of slaves, and these slaves are owned by this guy whose name is Prasnitz. He owns all of this entire slave army that Daenerys wants. And what he wants in return is a dragon, which Daenerys has. And so Daenerys is going to, as you'll see, agree to give him a dragon for his slave army. And then something goes wrong, and there's a key point where everything turns. And this is how it works. I wanted to give you a, kind of an analogy here. There are two different languages in the show, two different Valerians. There's High Valerian, which Daenerys speaks. And then there's Astapori Valerian, which Krasny speaks. And it's kind of like they're far, they're very far apart. Kind of like the same distance as Sanskrit and Hindi, or like Latin and Spanish. They're quite a fair distance apart. 
The grassroots can understand bull, but that's the one he speaks is Astapori Valyrian. So, then, and this is, of course, uh, this is what it looks like, basically. What happened was um, the part with the little broken islands on the bottom, that was the old Valyrian Empire. On the right, that was the old Viscari Empire. The Valyrian Empire came and destroyed the Viscari Empire and implanted their own government and made the language High Valyrian. And so people spoke it there for thousands of years and it eventually became Astapori Valyrian. So that's what Krasny speaks. All right? So it kind of looks like this. There are Giscari words in Astapori Valyrian that exist. And so because of that, Dohaideros is the High Valyrian word for slave. Buzda is the Giscari word for slave. And so what happens is Daenerys decides to take his word because she reveals to him that he, uh, she understands what he's been saying. She has to change it a little bit. She adds an eye on the end. But, see, the guy the whole time thinks that she just speaks English. And so he's been having a translator tell her what he's been saying. She reveals to him that she understands what he's been saying in this line by using his own word to show that she has really understood everything that he said. So she doesn't even use her word, she uses his word. And now this is the scene, and we're going to make sure real quick that we get audio. If we don't, we're going to fix it. So just give us one second here. Good.
one more cat. The little room has, uh, it's, it's a, a mandarin.
culture people. So how does your language creation take place? Do you take into consideration the culture and geography? Yeah. Okay, so when I create the language, uh, the first thing that I do is I take into account the fictional context that that language is spoken in. So for example, with the with the Dothraki, everything that I got, everything that I learned about the Dothraki came from the books. Because the books, there were four of them written by the time that I started working on the show. So I read all of the Daenerys chapters very closely to figure out as much as I could about the Dothraki culture. And then I tried to replicate what I saw there. Now when it comes to um, uh, you know, the influx of cultures and other things like that, the Dothraki are very nomadic. They kind of, they don't really have relations with other cities. They go out and raid them. So they don't have a lot of borrowings. Something like High Valyrian though does, and the, and the New Valyrian language does. So it has lots of borrowings from different languages that are incorporated into the language. And then of course those words get borrowed and turned into other things, and like um, in English. So something like uh, the game of Cybass, if you remember from the books, that's a word that has an ultimate Valyrian origin. So I take all of that into account when I'm creating a language, and that's honestly, uh, that part is the most fun. Yeah. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Have you created any pickup lines in the languages that you've created? You know, I, I'm sure I have. I don't know. I don't know if I can think of any off the top of my head. Because you know the thing is, I don't speak, I don't speak to talk your Valyrian fluently. I gotta, I always have to go back to the dictionary. Um, but uh, let, me, let me see if I can get something in the Uh Yeah, 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 yeah,